Welcome everybody to London Futurists. My name is David Wood. Our topic today is the 2020s, a decade of cognitive dissonance. Let me say a few words to introduce our speaker, David Hull. David Hull spent more than 20 years in media and entertainment. He worked at NBC and CBS and was part of the senior executive team that created and launched some programs you may have heard of, MTV, Nickelodeon, VH1, and CNN Headline News. David has won a number of awards, two Emmys, the prestigious George Foster Peabody Award, and the Heartland Award for Hank Aaron, Chasing the Dream. And he has been nominated for an Academy Award. He also won a Speaker of the Year Award from Vistage International, arguably the world's leading organization for CEO training. Nowadays, David is the Futurist in Residence at the Ringling College of Art and Design. He is the co-founder and managing director of the Sarasota Institute, a 21st century think tank, and the honorary president at the Future Business School of China. He has delivered more than 1,200 speeches, presentations, and corporate retreats on six continents and 16 countries. He has written 11 books, including most recently, The 2020s, A Decade of Cognitive Dissonance. David, welcome to London Futurists, and take it away. Well, thank you so much, David. I really appreciate it. Most of my presentations are to business groups, groups of CEOs, C-level suite. So I come from that background. Uh, so it's really um, a thrill to talk to people who self-define themselves as futurists, either professionally or just because it's an avocation that fascinates you. Uh, so a little bit of background. I'm always asked the question, you know, my wife and I will go out to dinner or something and I say, oh, so what do you do? <laughs> and I say, I'm a futurist. And then they say either, so what is that? Or, well, how'd you ever become a futurist, right? It, it, it's some weird name. Um, for me, it's always been that case because, you know, basically my path to being a futurist was I've lived my life ahead of the curve. I graduated from college with an art history degree and to justify that to people. And of course, you know, art really presages the reality. Um, I, all I wanted to do when I out of college, I lived in a van. So I did that. And then three years later, everyone was living in a van. And by then I was backpacking across Asia. And then of course people did that. And then you heard my reference uh, professionally. I was a, the number one salesperson in 1980 at CBS, which is the, you know, it's like working for the BBC at the time. It's not perfect analogy, but it was the number one network. And I had, you know, life was great. And I took a 50% pay cut to go join the about 20 people at the time who were going to create a, the, all the networks you just heard, specifically MTV, which is why I was brought in. And, uh, you know, at that time, cable was in 10% of the United States. Cable's never going to work. What do you mean video music? Who's ever going to watch a 24-hour news channel? So all of that. And then in the late 90s, I was the managing director of a dot-com 1.0 that was the first company that created online courses. And so I had to sell that concept. Oh, That'll never work, right? So finally, it was in this century, I was giving a speech to, I'd been talking about the future of education and merging with technology. So I gave a talk to the, all the heads of uh, California higher ed, which is the, probably still is the greatest state university system in the United States, uh, heads of directors of educational technology. So I was giving this speech, it was the end of 2004, and it was one of those moments that changes your life. I was speaking about the future. Um, it had spoken about half an hour, 45 minutes, and I was in this zone, I was perfect. It was kind of like, uh, what is it that I'm doing? So I witnessed myself and I said, well, I'm speaking about the future. I'm a catalyst to get people to think about it. So then I became a full-time futurist. Now in my 20s, the, the three names I always honor and stand on the shoulders of are um, Dr. Alvin Toffler, Marshall McLuhan, and our Buckminster Fuller. I stand on those shoulders of those greats looking into this century. So I'd read all of those guys. I'd read a lot of science fiction, the classics of the time in the 70s, you know, Asimov, Heinlein, Herbert, Clark. And uh, so I was, you know, I put it in the context of becoming a futurist. So and I'll, and I'll talk about that in my presentation. So that's my background, and I, and I really relish the Q&A ahead. So let me just uh, get onto the screen here and pull up my PowerPoint. 
I'm going to go through this PowerPoint very quickly um, so, so that we have time for questions. But what I want you to, to understand is I, I, will, I will move very quickly, assuming that this is a very intelligent and future focused audience, so we can have a lot of good conversation. So I believe that this is the most disruptive decade in history, the 2020s. Now, it's based on the first book. David listed the second book, which is the, the, the 2020s, the decade of cognitive dissonance. And I'll bring that up the second part of the presentation. But, but basically, um, since about 2016, I started realizing that all the trends that I was looking at uh, and focusing on, even more the dynamics of the, uh, of the global world, was, was uh, all going to come together in this decade. So I started realizing that, that this is what I was going to be writing about, because you can't talk about the 2030s or 2040s without getting through the 2020s. I think the 2020s as a decade will sh set the trajectory of humanity uh, for at least to 2050, if not for the whole century. And when I say we as a pronoun, I'm talking about humanity in this presentation. So to get right into it, um, it's a, it, it, it is the most transformative time. These are arbitrary dates, as you know, as futurists. Could be 2018 to 2040. But this period, because of everything I'm going to suggest to you, realities we know it with change. Now, you're going to see, I give, I've been giving a lot of presentations to C-level uh, execs. So, you know, they're running organizations. So I put in C-19. C-19 stands for COVID-19. So the, the beauty of COVID-19 for, for me as a futurist is that I've always had to persuade people that reality is not fixed, you know, so I suspend reality. And, and, and the point is, is that, is that now people have felt it, right? They have the cognitive dissonance that, God, the future, the reality is different than I thought it was going to be a year ago. So this would be the time when the old gives way to the new. And, and those of you that are history people know that's a, that's a uh, historical statement from Schumpeter, creative destruction. Um, across the board disruption. I can't think of anything that's not going to be disrupted in this decade. Across the board disruption. And this is one of the things I've had to fight, certainly in the United States. That's a stupid question in the 2020s. When will things come back? Nothing's ever going to come back. It's never going to come back to normal, whatever normal is. Yeah, it's going to bounce forward. The economy's not going to bounce back. It's going to bounce forward. And, and uh, this is one of the things that, uh, again, people think reality is fixed. So this is one of the metaphors I've used very successfully. COVID-19 is like a bicycle with training wheels for this decade. As kids or parents, we've all had that experience of a bike with training wheels. You get the kid on the bike with the training wheels, don't have to worry about balance, but they have to learn turning, braking, stop signs, hand, hand, language, hand signals, and all that stuff. And then you take the, the wheels away. So what COVID-19 has really been a great metaphor for as a futurist is the, is the reality that, okay, we've learned to ride our bike. So we've got balance to go through all the rest of this disruptive decade. Major dynamics, I'll put them up. I, you know, I didn't wanna have a long list if you had 10 or 12. I mean, we, we all know the complexities of the world today, but I wanted to, to, to simplify it. I mean, I think I oversimplify things to give people aha moments age of intelligence, age of climate change, emerging new consciousness, and the reinvention of capitalism and democracy. Age of intelligence, obviously, what, what we have referred to as artificial intelligence, um, combined with the complete mapping of, of the brain. All my life, I'm an aging boomer. People have always said, we've learned more about the brain in the last 10 years than all the time before. Well, this is the 10 years we're gonna have full understanding of all aspects of the brain. And that, of course, will lead to significant changes in artificial intelligence and in computing. Age of climate change, obviously, we all know this. I've written two books on this, and I created a global nonprofit uh, called The Spaceship Earth. There are no passengers in Spaceship Earth. We're all crew. Now, emerging new consciousness, uh, this is something I've seen all along. My first um, fork in the, in, the, in the sand was, in the ground was, to call my blog Evolution Shift. I believe that the end of this decade, we will be emerging into a new evolutionary connection. Um, and, I, and I call it the neurosphere, lifting off from Taha de Chardin's new sphere of 100 years ago. Uh, reinvention of capitalism and democracy. This is really clear. I'll talk about this. Both of these concepts were invented in the late, 18, late 1700s. Uh, so, so they need to be reinvented and updated for, for this century. 
So back in 2005, after that experience I had, I went back and I started thinking, gee, maybe I should become a futurist. I've always been fascinated by the future. And so I look back from the vantage point of early 2005, back to when the information age got its name. Now, again, I mentioned uh, Toffler. I've read all, all of his books. You know, so I'm under the concept of the ages, right? Industrial age, information age, agricultural, industrial information. So the information age got its name in the mid 70s, the third wave, right? And, and so from the vantage point of 2005, I looked at back to 1975. In that 30 years, five things had happened that would trigger a new age, any one of them. End of the Cold War, beginning of the global economy, analog to digital, personal computing, the internet. And I knew back in 2005 that high-speed wireless was just a matter of time. So those six things meant that there had to be a new age. So what to call it? The reason I'm taking time with this is this is what put me on the map. I'm known for the shift age. So basically, I got it down to three forces that, you know, each age has certain forces and dynamics that shape it. First of all, it's the flow to global. Now, obviously, global economy, but it's also the concept of global, right? 20 years ago, we talked about foreign, overseas, international. Now we talk about global. But the single most significant point I make with this, and it'll be the title of um, the fourth book in this series, is we are at the global stage of human evolution. We've gone from family to tribe, to village, to city, to city state, to nation state, and the only remaining boundaries for now are planetary. All the major issues we face as humanity are global in nature. So we've, we've organized around all of us at the same time as individuals, you and I, are more powerful than individuals have ever been before. And of course, um, that's based on the explosion of choice. Um, the, the going shopping as a child yeah, with my mother. And I, and I did go to school when I was three and I was five in London, by the way, but I can't remember those experiences that well. But the explosion of choice, number of serials, number of channels to watch means the power moves from the producer to the consumer, from the institution to the individual. So explosion of choice. So as we're getting organized around all of us, each individual is becoming ever more powerful. And that is due to the still the most dynamic force at play in the world, which is accelerating electronic connectedness of the planet. Most people initially think of the uh, internet, but I want to put it in the context of, of the smartphone, which, which basically is there's, there's self, smart, cell phone ubiquity. Um, it, my wife's probably 50 feet away in the other end of the house, outside in the yard. And if I were to call her cell phone to cell phone, you know, one, one thousand, two, one thousand, three, one, five seconds, her phone would ring. If I were to call the guy who used to book me into China, right, maybe another two seconds because it's 15,000 miles. So the difference between 50 feet and 15,000 miles is two seconds because of the relay off the satellite or the cable into the ocean. So there's no time or distance limiting human communication. Couldn't say that 15 years ago. When you talk on a cell phone to stay with that, you know, hey, how you doing? Can you hear me okay? One of the next things just goes, where are you, right? So there's no time, distance, or place limiting human communication. Couldn't be said 15 years ago. In fact, it, it, modern humanity has been on this planet for 170,000 years, and only for 170 has the telegraph been around. So that means for one one thousandth of the time that modern humanity has been on the planet, have we been able to communicate without having to be face to face, right? So this is profound. And, and the other thing that this does is it creates two realities, the physical reality that most of us have grown up in and the screen reality. So physical reality based on atoms, screen reality based on digits, and it, it, it's the screen reality that we're seeing in the future, right? I, in 2010, and I, I'm called upon to make forecasts because I deal with CEOs, I said there'd be a total collapse of physical retail in the United States, and there was. Why? Because what I was seeing on the screen, which was Amazon.com, but all that's changed, we're looking at one another in the physical reality, right? So, and not only that, so you got Airbnb and, and, and Uber, you got the platforming blowing up physical distribution, right? So these, these are the three forces of the shift age. And I've always been asked about how long it would be. And I always would say 20 to 30 years. So this is just rough. Nothing, ages don't begin in a particular year, of course, as you know. But, but so what this really is, it's the transition from reality to the new reality. The reality that we lived in up to the year 2000 and the new reality we'll be living in in the 23rd. Literally that's significant. So then on January 1st, 2010, just to give you a background, I, I named that this decade, 
transformation decade. Here's the definition of transformation. And what I found happening in, in corporate retreats and in, in speaking to lots of CEOs, I would say, Ms. CEO, Madam CEO, Mr. CEO, if you're not in the business of changing the nature, shape, and character of your company, it may not exist by the end of the decade. And there's clearly examples of that, right? So this is the decade of collapse of legacy thinking. When I wrote about this in my 2012 book, Entering the Shift Age, you know, I thought it was kind of clever, it was kind of smug for a moment, but it really became one of the significant takeaways that, that the readers took from that is uh, legacy thinking is thought from the past. Thought from yesterday creates the reality of today. So we, we, this is the decade where the collapse of legacy thinking is occurring. What do you call a cell phone? How do you, just, how do you communicate? How do you work? Where do you work, right? And another way of thinking about this is that um, it's the first decade of 21st century thought. This is what future historians are going to say. They're going to say this was the decade, 2010 to 2020, when humanity first started to think 21st century thought. The analogy I use is, is it, it's American, but it has, a European, it has an English reference, is the 60s didn't start January 1st, 1960. They started when President Kennedy was assassinated November 22nd, 1963, followed two and a half months later when the Beatles were on Ed Sullivan, at least for Americans, and that blew up you know, the English invasion, so to speak. And that was followed three and a half months later by the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, which is the escalation of the war in Vietnam. So 63, 64 really defined the 60s decade as we look back on it. Hence, 2010 and 2020 are gonna define this century. And, and the transition started here in the transformation decade, but it really is moving fast in the 2020s. So that brings us to the 2020s. Now, you know, this is obvious. So what I say to business executives is you're gonna to have to be able to manage against the metrics for which you have been measured and be open to the new metrics you're going to have to learn to master with the new reality that's rushing at you. This is a cognitive dissonance holding two different forms of, of uh, business structure, if you will, in your mind. So the new realities of the 2020, of course, this is not the true definition from uh, Darwin. But really, adaptability and resilience are the two key traits and attitudes and dynamics that any organization needs to have because it's not who how big you are or how strong you are or how fit you are it's how fast you can adapt and how much resilience you can bring to the change those that can do this a lot will have minimum cognitive dissonances those that don't bring a high degree of adaptability and resilience will fail so these now some quotes. I'm driven by quotes. These following four quotes are the four quotes that are in the front of the first book. Now, this is the quote that's up on my website. To somebody who's done new things, had arrows in my back, this has guided me. In the revelation of any truth, there are three stages. In the first is ridiculed, in the second is resisted, and the third is considered self-evident, right? So this is the decade of the self-evidency of uh, climate change is real, joins, um, you know, that the earth is round. So, and, and this quote is the best quote about the future. And as people interested in the future, I find this is a really impactful quote. I've managed to put it in every single one of my books. It was the quote in front of my first book, The Shift Age. We should try to be the parents of our future rather than the offspring of our past. As I say to business people, you should try to be the parents of the future of your business rather than the offspring of the past of your business. And of course, the way I came to know David, and we can talk about it later in the Q&A, is the Fork in the Road project, which is it is time for humanity to parent our future that, that we want for this, for this uh, century. This quote is a great quote from the great Alvin Toffler. In 2006, he was asked the question, what is 21st century education going to look like? And he said, the illiterate of the 21st century would not be those that cannot read and write, but those that cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. So in the, in the context of education, he's talking about lifelong learning, right? Adult learning. Um, we've left the knowledge economy, we've entered the learning economy with the rapidity and explosion of data. 
So what I say to CEOs, what I say to you, and what I say to individuals is that unlearning is a verb that you're going to have to master. You're going to have to unlearn as much as you learn. In the process of learning new things, you have to unlearn the way you used to do things or the way you used to think about things or the context in which you put things. So this is why the cognitive dissonance starts to kick in. If you can't unlearn, you'll be very much suffering from cognitive dissonance this decade. Now, this quote is personal. And again, I keep referring to corporations. I won't know more because I've made the point. But, I, but I've been speaking to corporations on COVID in the future. And it, it helped me to be able to say that my business model went away. My business model was going to airports, getting on planes, going, getting picked up by limos or Uber, speaking to a large group of people. So that went away. So 95% of my income went away when COVID shut down. So I had to reinvent my business model. I've been a fan of Bruce Lee, and this was the quote that came to mind. Empty your mind, be formless and shapeless like water. You put water in a cup, it becomes a cup. You put it into a bottle, it becomes a bottle. You put it into a teapot, it becomes a teapot. Be water, my friend. So this literally, as a futurist who made his living by giving talks, I had to reinvent myself into the, into the vessel of COVID. So this gives me a lot of credibility, but it's also you know, the way, it's a really good metaphor. I like to speak in metaphors because they're, they're powerful. You know, be like water, flow with it. Don't be resistant to it. Don't be some kind of, uh, don't be a rock, if you will. So generations, I, do, I, I must confess, I, I know the numbers cold in the United States. I don't know them in the UK as well, but basically, I came up with this in my uh, aforementioned 2012 book, Entering the Shift Age, arbitrary dates by my analysis. These are the birth years of these two generations, okay? Right now, each generation is now bigger than the baby boomers are now and ever were. So, you know, there's a certain generational uh, ghetto, ghettoing of boomers. We think it's all about us and it's not. We are the third largest generation now in the United States of America. And the interesting thing about that is that <clears throat> these two are in the majority. They came in the majority in 2020. So the numerical majority of Americans are under the age of 40. And the interesting thing about that is that um, it's a global trend. Um, two thirds of the people alive in India are under the age of 35. 50% of the people alive in Nigeria are under the age of 21. So, so this is a, a whole generational tsunami, particularly in the United States. And the implications of that are obvious. So um, economic trends, again, I'll put these up. Uh, this is, again, because it's my audience. Um, the whole world is moving from ownership to rental. Uh, you know, you don't buy DVDs anymore unless you collect them. You stream on Netflix or Amazon or whatever. You don't buy CDs. It's Spotify. Um, so ever more the sharing economy. And that's going to go forward, particularly within the context of the climate crisis. Uh, anything that's centralized is 20th century concept. Everything's getting decentralized and distributed, including energy, um, and obviously where we work and how we work and how we have futurist meetings. This is a concept that is particular to me that the way I present it is we've moved from place to space. We've moved from a place-based life based on atoms to a space-based life based on connectivity. And I always sort being down here in Sarasota, how how you know grandmas and grandparents go, hi, sweetie, how you doing? And at the other end, the grandkid is going, hi, this is grandma, she's here. They don't have a concept of distance. It's every day on their device, the device through which they see the world. So everything is happening in that regard. Think of it as a major overarching reorganization that goes on in this decade. This is really important. It's the time for corporations around the world to step up and face the common good. The new generations demand it. What are you doing to make the world a better place? Physical to digital, dematerialization. Anything that exists in the physical world is going to exist in the digital world. Ten years ago, you didn't buy clothes on the internet. Now you do. You didn't buy jewelry. Now you do. You didn't buy furniture. Now you do. You didn't buy cars. Now you do. You didn't buy homes. Now you do. There isn't anything that you, can buy, that you would want to buy that you can't buy online. So, so again, the screen reality is disrupting the physical reality. I'll put all of these up. They're all relevant. Um, customer centric, of course, is the only way going forward. 
culture, purpose, and vision each strategy for lunch. I can talk about that. That's a really big point to, uh, to people who own businesses or run corporations. I can't think of a, of a company or an industry that's not going to have more tech, fewer people, and more training. You know, COVID-19, just because we all had to learn how to use Zoom, right? Think that's just an example. Actively committed to the common good. Understanding embracing new technologies, which I'll take into shortly. So I've been asked, given my, you know, who, who, what's the leadership? And this is VUCA, and it's a, it's a traditional, it's known, it came out of the U.S. military, it went over to Japan. How to lead in volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous times. Uh, my co-author of one of my books, who, who edits my books now, is a co-author of a coming book about this with, a, with an Australian. So, so basically, that is the management and leadership way to think about the 2020s. Now, I put this up. Probably most of you have seen it. So this is early morning, 1900, Easter morning, um, Fifth Avenue, spot the automobile, right? There's only one. So then, 13 years later, where's the horse? There's none. The point I make with this, of course, is more than 100 years ago, and the speed of change is maybe one-tenth to one one-hundredth, whatever your comfort zone is of now, everything that I begin to say after this, you have to accept. But the other thing, a point I like to make, which is at this point in time, if you were in a Manhattanite, the number one uh, environmental problem you had was horse manure, right? So what did the cabbies do? They had a big canvas back and the bag in the back of the horse. They went over to the west side of Manhattan, dropped it in the, in the Hudson, because that's what you did back then, and then went on. They didn't understand that the solution to horse manure was a new drivetrain, right? So you can't take a future considered problem and solve it with the present solution. I always say innovation is out of date, right? Innovation is iterative change. Steve Jobs was not an innovator. If he was an innovator, we've had a black bear with a bigger screen. Steve Jobs was a disruptor. So I keep hearing people, oh, we, we provide innovation solutions to, no, you don't. You know, that's just, that's just iterative change. Again, body by Fisher, right? This is the story of adaptability. In the 1880s, five brothers, the Fisher brothers, had a, carriage manufacturing company in Ohio. When they saw what was going on in Detroit, they opened a, a, a shop in Detroit. The thinking from the eldest brother was, we make carriages. I don't care where the horses pull them or horsepower pulls them, right? So then General Motors, if you grew up in America and General Motors family as mine was, had body by Fisher. It was the most significant brand. Well, General Motors sold them, get, bought their company. And when the Fisher brothers we cashed out in the mid 1920s, they were the richest people in America. So adaptability is key. Don't just give up, you have to adapt. Future is showing up now. I love this quote because people say, well, what about this? You know, the future is here, it's just not evenly distributed. It's a great quote. So I'm going to put these up. You guys know them all. We can come back and talk about them. Every single one is significant. There is no doubt about that. Uh, what's really interesting relative to the consciousness part is that there's now technology because you put on a hat that captures a, a cap that captures your brain waves and you can do brainwave computer interface. That should be mainstream in the offices um, in, in the city and elsewhere by, the 20, by 2025, right? So if we spend five years doing brainwave computer interface, it should stand a reason that we might lift off and go direct telepathy. Augmented virtual reality, no question, blockchain, implantable chips, additive printing. I'm sure all of you know these. We can talk about them. The interesting thing is that when you, when you talk about, um, when you talk about the, most, the most important or profound inventions in history, you get the fire, you get fire in a wheel. After that, it tends to be electricity. Why? Because most of the other things run on electricity. The thing you need to think about with electricity is that it has changed how humanity lives on the planet more than any other invention, right? It, it, central heating, right? It air conditioned the sun belt in the United States, microwave ovens, coffee makers, things like that. But at the moment that we saw light, it was a flickering light bulb. All we could know about the future of, of electricity was, oh, it's gonna bring light to dark. We didn't see air conditioning. We didn't see microwave ovens. We didn't see electronic media, right? It's the same thing. I think AI, as you know, it is going to be is impact how humans live on this planet as much as electricity. 
but right now we can't see it. So we hung up on this stupidity thing of, you know, robotic overlords or things like that. So it's very difficult to predict. So think of it as the potential for being a significant impact on how our species lives as electricity. Um, so back in 2016, you know, those of you who follow artificial intelligence know it started to take off mid, mid decade because, you know, the, the big thing, of course, was the AlphaGo beating the Go champion, right? So I went back in and I looked up intelligence in five dictionary. This one is from dictionary.com. In not one of them, in the definition of intelligence, use the word human. Dolphins are intelligent, whales are intelligent, the universe is intelligent, right? So why do we call it artificial? So I know I'm swimming upstream on this, but the reason, the, the fact that the conversation is so skewed about artificial intelligence is the word artificial. The only time that artificial has ever been good for me is when I was skiing in the Rockies and there was no snow, but they had artificial snow so they could open some of the ski lifts, right? So the point being is that I think in some subliminal, sublinguistic way, we've skewed the conversation about artificial intelligence in a negative way because it's not real. It is real. What I call it is technological intelligence because that's a truer name. I know I'm swimming upstream on this, but technological intelligence, and the human-initiated, technologically enhanced intelligence, that in partnership creates the next level of intelligence. To some degree, if you're transhumanist, you get this. Um, it's neither, it's not either or, it's, but it's partnership. It will transform every aspect, just about every aspect of economics. And it's going to show the next level of human evolution. So technological intelligence, I call TI. It's a better name. It's a truer name. It's a name that gives it upside in addition to downside. And of course, it's integrated with bioengineering, genetic alteration, transhumanism. So intelligence accelerated. Basically, this is the decade. And I've written a book on the future of healthcare. So the external plug-in and internal implants are very significant. So in hacking the wetware, that's another way of saying neuroscience, right? I mean, we're, we're hacking the hardware, the wetware, and the software all at once all to be integrated into our next evolutionary step. Explosion of data, I'll put this up. As you know, a zettabyte is a, is a, 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 a billion, a trillion gigabytes, okay? So this is how much data humanity has, has generated in each of these um, years. So just look at that. We're going from 35 from last year to 12,000 in 19 years. Talk about information explosion. So the point is we've invented the right technology technological intelligence at a time where we're exploding data and our cerebral cortex can't handle it. So it's a compatible evolutionary step. So basically all of this, and I'm putting it up because you, whoops, because you know, you guys know this. This is what I think technological intelligence, accelerating technology and big data are coming together to provide. So, you know, these are the two quotes from two of the great, philosophers. Clark said this in, in the 1950s, and Bertrand Russell wrote this uh, about 100 years ago. The goal of the future is full unemployment, <laughs> right? And, you know, when you think about it, to be able to fill leisure intelligently is the last product of civilization. So leisure is defined as answering the question, so what do you do when you're not working? So what we're about ready to have here is for the first time in history at higher levels of society and at lower levels of society, we're going to have people who get to, who will be starting to define themselves without starting with what they do for a living, right? Um, so what does this mean? It means a massive change in thinking, non-job definition of the self, complete recasting of tax and social policies, global common goods, national service, for example, um, uh, England and the United States could certainly use this right now for the unemployment. New places for interactivity. So in the collapse of the, the coming collapse of the workplace, you know, where there's, when, when downtown London has half vacant office buildings, right? Um, what are the new places? You know, I always like to talk about Starbucks. It's not that just Starbucks persuaded us to spend an inordinate amount of money on a cup of coffee. It's that when they started expanding it, they did in the 1980s. In the United States, 
in the 1980s, 1% 1 of the workforce were independent contractors. In 2019, it was 12%. So right as uh, Starbucks was expanding, there was the need for the third place. Like I've worked at home for 20 years and, and the bottom line is, so where do you want to meet? Well, it's a Starbucks, so it's the third place. So what are the new places for human activity if they're not going to be in the workplace? And, 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 and how does that affect productivity? And then I always say people, you know, that's what people think of me as some corporations, their future team. Every corporation, the larger they are, the more they need to have a person, if not staff, learning the business and then facing out down to the garage what might disrupt this industry or what might disrupt this company. So intelligent environment. We, you know, right now we're talking about smartphones, smart uh, doorbells, smart thermostats. So we're moving from the dumb environment to the smart environment. In this decade, we're going to move to the intelligent environment. In other words, rooms will be intelligent by the end of this decade. Our environment will be intelligent. You know, I always talk about, I always talk about, um, um, externalization of the mind. For any of you that have written a, a list, you've externalized your mind, particularly if you write the night bef right before what I have to do the next day so you get a good night's sleep. So what this thing is, is the ultimate externalization of the mind, right? My son lives in Amsterdam. I don't know his phone number. I just punch Christopher and he calls up, right? So we're externalizing our mind. We're going to externalize our mind even more into our environments. I'll walk into a room to give a speech, assuming I continue to do that, and people will say, People will say, uh, I'll say to the room, how many people are here? And it'll know. I mean, so we're moving into science fiction here, uh, and, and, but it's real. and science fact. And the interesting thing, the next thing is everywhere consciousness. Prior to COVID in 2019, I was tracking some research where in two different independent places, they were talking about uploading consciousness in 2029. Think of that as you will be able to upload your memories so that your grandchildren can experience your life through your memories. Now that, I mean, that's, it's hard to fathom. And I don't know if COVID upset that, I haven't really gone back and looked, but, but that's significant. You know, that's how fast we're moving in this decade. So of course, I'll put all of these up. I can come back, as, as David knows, I gave a talk on Thursday, um, facing the climate crisis in five minutes. It's never happened before. So the scientists have gotten it wrong because they thought it was going to be a linear progression. The, the deniers got it wrong because they said, well, it's never happened. It's the six, six inch in event. It's the only one ever caused by a single species, us. And the silver lining today is fight or flight. The, 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 every single day, there's a, there's a climate change story, right? Already at one degree Celsius, and it's triggered all this stuff. And we're, we're on the road to get to three degrees uh, catastrophic by the middle part of this century. Again, I've written two books on this. I've, I've chosen to be the futurist who speaks about green. So my book in 2019, uh, Moving to a Finite Earth Economy Crew Manual, if, if we don't, by 2030, fork in the road, 2020s, change the trajectory, we won't have civilizations. We know it by 2100, period, okay? So we're now moving, and this is my phrase, the time of denial to the time of disconnection. So, uh, for example, if anybody is listening to me and, and you have said that you believe in concern about climate change for 10 or more years, and during that time, have you ever bought an SUV? Have you bought a big truck? Have you bought a big car? Have you bought something new rather than used? So we're going to have to change. So we're disconnected. Oh, I, I believe we need to face climate change, but I still want, or I don't know the consequences, right? I don't know that if I have a quarter pound uh, hamburger in a restaurant, that six pounds of CO2 goes in the atmosphere. There's a disconnection between actions and consequences. So we've all grown up in the growth economy. Circular economy is only 9%. We do the, we're the first people that do the research on that in 2019. Only 9% of the global economy is circular. So we failed since first Earth Day, reduce, reuse, recycle 50 years ago. So we have to move to a finite Earth economy. You can't have infinite growth on a finite uh, Earth. And this is where this spaceship Earth comes in. We all think of ourselves as a spaceship and we're over consuming all our resources on the ship and we're not getting resupplied. So this is the book about the cognitive dissonance that jumped out at David and I'm going to drive into it. And I know I'm going on a little bit long, David. I'm, I'm just, uh, is that okay? Okay. Um, I didn't give you much time to answer that. So this is the second book. It says book two. So as I said, I've decided to write a, a series of high level, short, inexpensive books. 
All my research from being a, a love and book published author is that in this time of short attention span theater, um, a hundred page book, 10 chapters, high level concept, read in three hours, that's what the market wants. So this is the second book. And I knew it would be the second book because a decade of cognitive dissonance is what people in, in now and will be this decade. The interesting thing is I, I put this up promotionally for, for two weeks on Amazon and now I'm publishing the, the paperback uh, this weekend. And it's the second fastest selling book out of the gate of all my books. And I, ha and I didn't expect that. And I did promotionally prices, but I didn't expect that. But I think the answer is that I've given a name to what people are feeling post-COVID. I've given a name to cognitive dissonance. This, how do I handle this, right? And, and without going mad. So um, here's some quotes. Again, this is the definition. Dictionary definition, psychological conflict resulting from incongruous beliefs and attitudes held simultaneously. I think this quote from Franz Fanon is really good. And think about how it pertains to the, when you read the newspapers. Sometimes people hold a core belief that is very strong. When they're presented with evidence that works against that belief, sorry, the new evidence cannot be accepted. It would create a feeling of the extremely uncomfortable called cognitive dissonance. And because it is so, sorry, important, to protect the, the core belief, they rationalize, ignore, and even deny anything that doesn't fit in with their belief. So, Festinger is the guy in the 70s who really developed, as, as, as David, I was really impressed, David, that you had you'd said, oh, I read, I read his, his work from the 70s. When dissonance is present, in addition to trying to reduce it, the person will actively avoid situations and information which would like to increase the dissonance. And finally, this quote, and if you don't know who this guy is, he's known for two reasons. I've known him first because he's the single greatest academic scholar in the United States, Columbia University, on Buddhism. Second of all, he happens to be Uma, Thurner's, Uma Thurman's father. Wisdom is tolerance of cognitive dissonance. Another way of saying it, holding two contrasting thoughts in your mind at the same time. So... In the book, I, I go back to what I think were the three most documented times of change in human history. The 75 years starting with the movable type press, you know, ending with the high renaissance. And that was 75 years, and there really wasn't any rapid communication. Everything up until 1825 basically was basically horse days. That was measurement of distance, right? So these are the 75 years, 1775 to 1820, the invention of capitalism, democracy, industrial revolution, um, the cotton gin, the steam engine, all of this, right? And then, of course, 1875, when we, we firmly moved from the agricultural to the industrial around the world. I always think of how the industrial North Union defeated the agricultural South, the Confederacy, and that really switched it, at least from the American point of view. The point I want to make is this decade will have at least as much change as the 75 years in the first 50 years, and pretty much as much change as about two thirds or three fourths of the last one, right? The point is that during these times, there was no connectivity. So the, the, the movable type press was still being rolled out in 1525, right? Um, Luther putting the, the putting, nailing on his, his thing in the, in the door of the church, only in 1875-25, and I have a book, I have the list, it goes on forever of the inventions in these last years. But the other thing was, it was multi-generational. It took maybe, because people didn't live as long, it took maybe three generations to experience the full change of the first one and two generations for the second. But 1875-1925, there were some people that probably lived that, right? And so they experienced it. But, but today, of course, we're talking about a decade in people's lives, right? So we're gonna experience a decade as much as these times. And that's why the, before there was no such thing as cognitive dissonance, you know, only maybe that last part where people, well, one, one generation went through it all because cognitive dissonance is the disruption of reality. And, and you know, it, they didn't, it wasn't felt within a single person in any one of the prior ones. So it's ongoing. You know, this is again, the great, great um, metaphor. Can't go back you know, back is light at the end of the tunnel metaphor. So in the United States, we're talking about, oh, the, the vaccines. Is this finally light at the end of the tunnel? 
And what I've used that metaphor is, is the daylight from which we entered the tunnel is different, was different than the daylight that we're exiting the tunnel from. So while we've been in the tunnel, you know, COVID has taken five years worth of change and collapsed it into one, right? So there's, so the light at the end of the tunnel is not the light that we knew when we went into it. I always say stand and change. The only constant in the universe is change. If there wasn't change, there wouldn't be time, right? We know this. Time measures change. So stand in change. The only way you can't be disrupted from change is if you were in a state of change, because then you don't notice it. And, and then I always say to business people, what is the core? You know, don't get lost in the adaptability of, of we've done it or do we go back to the office or stay at home? Those are peripheral things. What is the through line of your business? What is the through line of your intention as an individual? What is your through line that while all this stuff is changing is the through line that will get you through with minimal um, cognitive dissonance? So finally, just go through this list. Technological intelligence, massive disruption, generational shift globally, disruptive energy transition and disruptive transportation. Each of these is 20% of the global GDP. So 40% of the global GDP is going to be disrupted in this decade just from these two. And I don't know what this is going to look like. It's a great reset. You know, prior to COVID, there's, there was 300, almost $300 trillion of outstanding debt against a global economy of 85 trillion. So 3.3 ratio of, of, of debt. To, and if, if you go into all the... Um, the leverage things, you got 1,200, excuse me, leverage debt instruments, you got $1,200 trillion of debt to be reconciled. I don't know how that's going to happen, which is one of the reasons that I've been getting interested in blockchain, because blockchain may be the answer. Don't know. So we know this, we know this, massive change, old market metrics give away to new, and even the definition of life is going to change. In other words, this is the decade without a doubt where morality is going, to, is going to be the only thing facing radical uh, change in medicine. You know, the Jarvik heart in 1966, the first uh, um, artificial heart, when that was implanted, the Pope said, that's sacrilegious, the body is God's work, right? I mean, so we're going to still come up against those old stuff. So it really is all of these. I put up the hashtag fork in the road, that's forkintheroad.com. Um, project.com and it's an incredible time to be alive so it took me a little bit longer i'm sorry dave i'm all done david i'm all done i'll leave those up i'll send you the powerpoint if you want it david so everybody who's listening can have a keep it to yourselves i'd appreciate it but you can have that if you'd like it to go back and listen again to the recording thanks well, david david you've given us a great deal to think about uh, people's minds i think are buzzing there are a few questions that have popped into the q a window and i'm going to take a couple of them straight away i encourage yeah. audience members to take a look in there and maybe add your own questions we will take the screen away in a few minutes so it's just the two of us that'll be yeah on i'll screen. just leave this up in case people want it but right that's away. good for now so one of the questions sets of questions is on is this really true that there is such an acceleration and that this is such a different time? For example, Gordon Silverman, who is an emeritus professor at a Manhattan College and has been at Columbia College in New York since 1959. So he's seen a few things. When he says, is this really going to be more disruptive than the decade before the American Revolution or the US Civil War? And in the past, people have pointed to the Black Death and how that changed society so much. I think you partially answered that by what you said next. But uh, on, on the same theme of are we overstating this here, we futurists, when we talk about the pace of change, I want to take the point that Didier Cornell has made. Didier is uh, based in Brussels. And he says he's not at all convinced concerning a global acceleration of technological progress. If we compare planes, space travel, cars, or even cities between 1920 and 1970, there are many more differences in that five decades than between 1970 and 2020. And this is similar. I think you must be familiar with the work of Robert Gordon, the historian of what he calls the second industrial revolution in his massive book, 
a lot bigger than yours. Uh, it's one of the biggest books in my bookshelf, The Rise and Fall of American Growth. He argues again and again that it's this special century, 1870 to 1970, seeing so many changes in people's real ordinary life, you know, the invention of the dishwasher, the internal uh, uh, toilets, uh, running water and electricity and the telegraph. And that won't be matched by what we are seeing today. So have you anything to add on that? Uh, yeah, yeah, I do. I do. I'm not trying to be an alarmist. If you think of the question, Didier, and I'm looking at it, um, you talk about 1920, 1950, right? That's 50 years. That 50 year period will have more change than this decade will, but it's over 50 years. So maybe say there's twice the amount of change in that 50 year period than will happen in this one 10 year period. You know, my father, my parents have both died. Um, but when my parents were born, you know, they, they had limited electricity. They didn't have phones. They didn't have radios. They didn't, you know, my, my father was born in 1913, my mother in 1919, right? They never got on planes until sometime in the 40s, I don't think. So it was, but the real thing is this connectedness, right? There's no time, distance, or place limiting. I have this iPhone, right? So, you know, I'm getting, I'm getting news bulletins. Hey, today in China, there's a tsunami in the Philippines. That would take two weeks or a couple of days. So, so when I was growing up in Chicago, even if it was the New York Times, which my parents subscribed to, what was reporting from Asia was two days late. When I traveled around Europe when I was a teenager, you know, the International Herald Tribune was reporting stuff that was two days old. Right now I get it on my phone. So it's, it, the cognitive dissonance occurs with the massive amount of change coming into the individual at once. If you look at the 1920, in 1920, there wasn't TV, there was limited radio, there was only newspaper, right? So, so the telegraph and the wire services was the fast it could go. Right now, I'm about ready to get, because I've got this new green screen studio for live streaming, I'm about ready to get 500 megabytes upload into my, into my home, right? So it, it is the connectivity and the speed that's accelerating. Plus, I could go on, I could give you a list of what I see is happening in big things, but I'll move on to more questions. But, but basically, think of what you said, Didier, in, 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 in 50 years, right? 1970, just think about, you didn't have a smartphone 20 years ago. You, didn't, you couldn't buy anything much online 20 years ago. You, didn't, you couldn't fly, fly 3,000 miles in a day for a speech the way I have 20 years ago. You just couldn't. So, so I, I think it's just the acceleration of connectivity. Let's take a question from uh, Craig Heath. Uh, he asks, what is the one action that we as individuals should take away from this talk? And after all, you said we should be adaptable, but right. what, what does it actually mean to be adaptable? You have said that we should reinvent capitalism and democracy, but that uh, sounds very abstract and everybody would like to make these improvements. So what practical things should we as individuals do as a result of this insights that you've been bringing? Well, the, the simplest answer is that reality is not fixed, it's mutable. And this decade, it's gonna be more mutable than any other decade of my life. In other words, change equals reality. What I've written about in the book, of course, is that we don't like that. So we wake up in the morning, we have the same morning ritual, we go get the same cup of tea or cup of coffee, we get on the same commute, commute to work the same way. We have, and so we assume that that means it's fixed. All we're doing is we're projecting habits into the present to maintain the past. And that doesn't work. You can't do that. So reality is mutable and reality is going to change more quickly than it ever had. Any kind of reality that, it, that you live your life within. That's the simplest answer. So we have to see that the world can be changed, is mutable, that many things which were taken for granted are now up for reinvention. I, I I would invert it. It's not that the world can be changed, is the situation is going to make us change. In other words, the implication is, if the world is changing, we can choose to participate or not. And I'm saying, no, the, the world is going to force us to change, whether we like it or not. And the degree to which we like it is the degree to which we can anticipate it and understand the opportunity in it. In other words, in COVID, 
one of the great dynamics I'm finding is, is rebirth of humanity. People are try, trying to do a more, living a more meaningful life. They, what, what, what the crisis of COVID has done is create opportunity for new directions at the deepest spiritual, emotional, philosophical, and intellectual levels in humans. So there's a question from Lilian, I'm just looking closer, Lilian Orman, Orman who right. asks about the reaction of these ideas from the CEOs you talk to. Do they grasp the necessity for the scale of change? And what is the potential role of the multinational companies in that case to take the lead to the adaptation that you've been talking about? Some do, some don't. Um, the smaller they are, they tend to be more adaptive, you know, turning a battleship versus a PT boat. But, but um, I think that they still have legacy thinking, like we need to be, we're, we're a big corporation, but we need to act small. Or we need to act um, um, in, in some small metaphor way. And that's still old. So I don't, the bigger you are, the, the more you're at risk, right? I mean, the, wh what do we know from COVID? We know that the education system is, is not up to snuff. We know the healthcare system is not up to snuff. We know that the entertainment industry is completely collapsed and be real in, in a 21st century model. We understand hygiene is different. Public health is different. Um, all, all, retail is all different. So the point I'm making is that um, uh, the three, three loose categories of employees and entities that I've dealt with in the last six months, the, the old ones, which I just want to go back to the way it was, oh, won't happen, you'll be out of business. Second one is, oh, we've all adjusted to working from home, so we've been a bit adaptable, but our business model hasn't changed enough. So we're going to have to bring some of that adaptability we experienced personally into the business model. And the ones that are really taking off and have increased sales and business and happiness and culture and purpose are the ones that have said, this is an opportunity. We have to change in anticipation of all this change that David talks about. So we, I want you to listen to David because we have to reinvent how we do business. And I'd say it's about uh, the longer COVID has gone on, the more it's part of the latter. The two most uh, upvoted questions currently are both on your comments about the direction you think the economy should probably go when you talked about we must move away from infinite growth to the idea of growth on a right. finite earth economy. So Terry Raby says, isn't ruling out infinite growth legacy thinking? And Dean Bubbly, who is a futurist uh, and analyst is based in the UK, takes it further. He says, I'm unconvinced by the finite earth metaphor. After all, the earth has free GDP and free energy, courtesy of solar radiation and gravitational attraction, tides, nuclear decay, and much more. So there is a great deal of potential energy available. And the question is how to collect, store, and move, and use the energy resources more effectively with the least amount of harmful side effects. So how important is it to you to emphasize uh, no growth? Uh, or would you point to and growth? No of growth is a, is a legacy concept. One of the reasons why this is so significant is all those pastimes, and even what Didier was saying, 1920, 1970, is based on the assumption of consumption, is based on the assumption of endless growth. Having lots of kids helped the GDP. So talking about low population growth is antithetical to the growth, right? So we need to go from conscious cons consumption to conscious non-consumption. In other words, it's more valuable if you can say, I only buy used things. I don't buy new things. New thing, if you buy something new, some way you've negatively impacted the planet. And, and so the point, and, and, and I've gone into this part, you know, in much more depth than David knows, and I've written two books on it, but the point is that it, relative to energy, 77% of all energy generated in 2019 came from fossil fuels. We, humanity, have to get that down to 30% by 2030, okay? Otherwise, ca catastrophe accelerates. The interesting thing about that is that 80% of all energy in the world today is consumed by the top 20 GDPs. So relative to climate justice, if the top 20 out of 195 countries, just 20 went from 77% down to 29, 28%, 
in this 10-year period, all the other 175 countries, all the undeveloped countries, the developing countries wouldn't have to do a thing, right? And as far as energy goes, it's all of the above. You can't have wind, you can't have just solar, you can't have just nuclear. I'm a big proponent of nuclear and I can get into that. But, but the point is, is it's all of the above because we need resources to increase battery technology for storage for wind and solar to be good, to be ever connected to the grid in such a positive way, such as Musk did in South Australia. We need, we, we need more intensive research on wave energy, on, on, on nuclear energy. The Gen 4 nuclear reactors are incredibly interesting. So it's all of the above and and there is a finite earth by the way for those of you that don't know if you it, i don't have it up here but type in um uh earth overshoot day okay earth overshoot day is the day after which humanity is taking more from the earth than can be regenerated so the ideal of earth overshoot day is twelve thirty-one at midnight in other words we haven't taken more from the planet in that in that year than the planet can we went over that in 1970 and have never looked back. And it was June, it was July 29th in 2019, okay? So, so the point is that we, humanity, consumes 1.7 Earth's regenerative capability every year. The only year that it hasn't gone up was last year. Why? Because for the first time in history, for the first time in history, three to four billion people did the same thing at the same time. They quarantined. And the air became clear, the water became pure, the animals came back, and carbon emissions went down and consumption went down, right? So it's not about anti-growth or no growth. It's about conscious non-consumption and conscious changing of how we get, where we get our energy from. So to dig into this a little bit more, I would say that legacy thinking is the idea that was quite common until recently, which is that as there is more population, as we do more things, we will inevitably have a heavier footprint on the environment. Right. And that trend was true for almost all of history. But in the recent years, there's been reversals and we are able to get more food from less agricultural land. We are able to uh, survive and have a very rich quality of life with less stuff than before. Andrew McAfee in his book, More From Less, the MIT professor, says it's by no means a done deal and there are still areas in which we are far too heavily impacting the environment, but in a surprising number of growing areas, there is a greater quality of human flourishing, uh, more energy usage, but potentially less impact on the environment. And what, what would you say to the argument that it's not the quantity of energy that counts, it's rather, it's how carbon intensive it is. And if we really address the issues, we can move more people quickly onto green energy rather than the carbon polluting energy. Well, the, the problem with that is we haven't, okay? The problem with that with the exception of COVID and quarantining, we may be talking more, there's far more solar panels, there's far more wind turbines, but we're making incremental progress. And yet all the metrics that we have to measure from the feedback from the earth, the rising temperature, the rising sea level, the, we, we, there's 150 species a day that are becoming extinct, which depending on where you source is 1000 times or 10,000 times the average over the last few millennium. So, so, all the, all the negatives are either accelerating geometrically or exponentially, and we're moving you know, um, incrementally. So it, it, it's only getting worse. That's why there's this disconnection. There's this somehow belief is the only sustainable is a meaningless word unless used at the planetary level. We, the last chapter of my book, The Cognitive, Decade of Cognitive Dissonance, is we have to move from us to them to we. No major problem facing humanity can be solved without a collective we direction, right? And, and this whole thing about you know, this, you know, food and all that stuff, I, I dispute that because what COVID has done, at least in the United States, and I think from all the research I've been seeing in the UK, is that we've taken the middle class and made them the working poor. So, so the wealth inequality is ever more increasing. You know, you talk about how, you know, the, the 1,000 billionaires in the, in the world, you know, got something like $15 trillion wealthier. 
and yet everyone else. And so, so what COVID did, it, it, it showed the flaws of our direction and our current state. So I think you and I would agree, but there are some encouraging trends, but they're not enough. And that what we're seeing in terms of some uh, adoption of renewable energy and uh, some uh, more sustainable agricultural practices, changes in the supply chain management, it's not enough, frankly. And we need to find a way to have that a bigger change in thinking. Yeah, I mean, the example, the example before, sorry, I just want to make this point, you know, the fork in the road, which, which I hope you can send out to the, to the members so they can understand it. But the fork in the road is simply a statement of urgency. We're at the fork in the road. Humanity on all levels by 2030 must move to the road of the good future we want to create, right? And, 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 and the issue with that is that, is that um, we can't, um, we're not moving fast enough. I did an article on Medium in the Fork in the Road blog on Medium, where I quoted from the, from the United Nations folks overseeing the 2015 Paris Accord. And they're saying it's totally failing because none of the countries are making the commitments or owning up to the commitments. And we've only decreased carbon emissions by 1%. And I'm sitting here doing the math. We have to, we have to decrease it by 67%, right? So, so the fork in the road initiative is urgency. Folks, 2015 climate accord is failed, right? The UN has failed. Um, the, the, the B team has failed. It, you know, I'm not saying that they're not doing the good work. It's just not being done fast enough. Somehow we've insulated ourselves. Well, you know, one of the throwaway phrases I say, one of the greatest forces we have to overcome facing climate change is the self-righteousness of, of greens, right? You know, well, uh, no, nuclear is not safe. Oh, BS, right? You know, I can, take, I can take you down the road on that. But, but the point is, we have to let go of the thinking that it's actually working. It's not working. That's what the fork in the road is all about. So let's dig into the fork in the road project a little bit. Sure. There's been some questions about that in the chat. What would you hope that the fork in the road project will accomplish in the next 12 months that's different from today, say? Well, I, you know, of the three futures, I'm the one most steeped in marketing. And I've helped launch MTV and, and Nickelodeon, CNN. And I wrote a, a book that was rated the fourth best pub marketing book published in the world in 2014 by a London-based uh, nonprofit who promotes marketing. Um, is I hope it becomes a meme, David. In other words, if I say fork in the road, I can't think of a human over the age of 10 that doesn't understand that metaphor. Somebody has been at a fork in the road. Actual, which way do we want to take on our bikes? Down to which career path do I want to take, right? So fork in the road is a known metaphor. I want hashtag fork in the road project to become a meme. You know, the, the, the single greatest meme in my lifetime was Occupy Wall Street. Why? Not because it's existing and it's a structure, which is people, which people think this, whatever happened to it. What happened to it was prior to 2011, when Occupy Wall Street happened, we all, all of Western culture talked about wealth as quintiles, first quintile, second quintile, third quintile, fourth. Now we talk about the 99 and one. So the meme coming out of Occupy Wall Street changed even how the Financial Times and the London Times think and talk and write about wealth inequality. Now it's the 99 and one or the one tenth of 1%. So a meme that changes thinking is what I want to come out of this so that everybody understands, hey, it's up to us and the time is now. So I like that answer a lot. And I, like you, I think it's not just technology that changes the world, it's ideas at the right time or exactly. memes. But what should the next step be when people say, oh, there's a fork in the road, therefore what? Are they going to be paralyzed at that fork or what action should they take? What, 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 what do you think the answer should be in people's minds in a year or two's time? Well, what I, you know, simple ways to say it. Do you have kids? Do you have grandkids? You should care about them. Uh, you, do, do, do you believe, I, I believe that the, the unborn of the future have a say in the decisions we're making about climate change because they're going to be living the reality of it. So I think that, um, I, for everybody that gets to the fork in the road and freezes, there's people who go right down where they want to go and try to say, hey, come along. So I'm only hoping, you know, David, so for example, if somebody, somebody's as a change agent, I say, don't take on, we're not, a fork in the road is not about policy, 
right? It's about urgency and about getting everybody to understand that we can co-author the future we want. It's only going to happen if a, it, it's not it's not top down. It's bottom up. It's bottom up to some degree with the top people who are movers are making a difference. Whether it's a Musk, a Gates, a, a, a Bezos. They've created the forks for us, right? We just have to go down the path. So I guess what I want, I'm sorry to, to be to go on about it, is everybody, whatever you're doing, whatever the change you think is better, become hashtag fork in the road. Accelerate it. Don't wait. There's a couple of reactions from PNJ uh, to this. Uh, he says, one drawback of the notion of a fork in the road is it's very binary. Should we not be training people to think in a more multivariate way? And I know actually you have dug down to four levels underneath as to right. what might be done. Uh, what question PNJ actually asks is about the potential change in education or learning as a way to address the issues that you've been uh, talking about. So do you see a potential change in education and learning or even a change in corporate values? That's the other thing you mentioned. No question. Uh, to answer the first part of the question, I put up the backdrop that was on our first Fork in the Road public event on Thursday. And you'll see, let's see if I can get out of it. You can see it's not just a simple Fork in the Road. In other words, the way to think about it is we have to build the detour now to go from the, from the, from the bad, road, the mindless, ignorant path we're on, we need to build, a, it's not even a fork in the road now, it's a detour back to the right road. So, so it's, it, yeah, it's simple, but it also is a, is a concept that everybody immediately gets. Relative to education, you know, I'm going to be part of a panel on the future. What is the curriculum going to look like in 2070 in the United States, right? So that's in November. And there's a quote from, for those of you that know Harari, Val Harari, who wrote Homo sapiens, right? He, was, he, he, he said, if anybody tells you about 2050 and it doesn't completely look like science fiction, they don't know what they're talking about. So I said to the guy who's running the panel, I said, well, what do you want me to say? I mean, if we're uploading consciousness by the 2030s, we can download Western Civ overnight. So, I mean, you know, I'm sorry what the teachers are about to hear, but, but it is, it, technology is just going to transfer. I mean, think about virtual reality. And think about what a five-year-old can do that they can't travel. They can go into virtual reality. They can go see the Mona Lisa. They can go do whatever they want. It, it, is, it is what what COVID has showed us is how 20th century all education systems are. Higher ed is going to get whacked, by the way, at least in the United States. It can't justify its cost anymore. Higher ed has gone up faster in cost than anything else in the United States since 1970, even more than healthcare. At the same line, at the same time, the salaries and wages have not gone up at all. So it, 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 it's invalidated itself. I think higher educations like the idea of working at home or like the idea of a paperless office, it was proposed and discussed for ages. And then it took a tipping point to bring about the transformation. Clayton Christensen, the writer right. about the disruption, he wrote a book maybe from 15 years ago saying that higher educational institutes couldn't survive in their current form and they would need to change, but they've been hanging on. But I think this COVID experience when people have been away from colleges for a long time is probably going to accelerate that change. But it shouldn't just be a change of how education is delivered. It should surely be a change of what is the, the content. Yeah. I, so that's where I, you know, I've written a book on the future of education, primary K through 12, but I've gotten involved at all higher levels. And I have five college, four college professor presidents on my advisory board for the Sarasota Institute. Basically, um, the way I just, the way I had to sell uh, online courses in 98, 99, was to say to somebody, think of a man who's fallen asleep for 300 years. And you wake him up and you take him outside and he sees a car and he doesn't understand it. You point up and you say, there's 200 people in that silver thing up in the sky. He can't comprehend it. You show him a flat screen TV and he thinks it's a window and he tries to see behind it and he doesn't understand what he's seeing anyway and he can't figure it out. Then you walk him into a college classroom and he says, and he's been asleep for 300 years. He says, oh, a college classroom. One individual standing in front, right? So, I mean, it, it, it is the oldest structure that has now become the most overpriced 
thing. So it is, it, it's going to get blown up. It has to be blown up. So we're coming towards the end of our time. I'm going to encourage the audience one more time to look in the set of remaining questions if there are some that you would prefer to prioritize and we can uh, move to them uh, in preference. There are two questions about mistakes that the futurists may have made. So Brian from Canada, who's asked, given your history at looking at the future, yeah. yes, there's been lots of amazing progress, but uh, we've also seen some of the future views have not panned out. Uh, so which of the predictions that you've heard do you think are examples of bad foresight that we might learn from? I I, you know, I feel that I'm responsible for my own forecasts and I can't comment on others unless I'm asked. So I am the only futurist that I know, and I have to update it. I, I just realized I'm about to say this the last six months, I haven't updated it. I'm the only futurist that I know that has a timeline on my website of the forecasts I made, when I made them, and what I said. Because otherwise, if it, it, corporations won't hire me if they can't see, you know, so like in 2006, I said oil would be $125 a barrel, and it was $55 a barrel, and it went up to 147 Nobody believed me, right? So, so the, the only forecast that I've gotten wrong, I totally missed apps. I've been saying for years that we're going to have, you know, my iPhone 8 has more computing power and speed than the Cray supercomputers in the 1970s and 1980s. I've always said we're going to have computers where the greatest amount of dis distributed uh, computing power in human history in our handheld devices, but I missed the concept of apps. Most of the other ones, David, that I've missed has been um, more on scale or time. Like I think I said in 2013, the 10% of American households would cut the cable by 2015. And it wasn't 10%, it was 8.5%. And in 2012, I said that by 2015, genetic mapping would be $1,000 per person. And it wasn't. It was about 2,500. But now it is. So, so it's more, I've gotten the direction right. I've just been wrong on, the, on either the timeline or the scale. But do you think, therefore, that futurists are meant to be predicting things accurately? Or are we meant to be giving people scenarios in their minds which cause them to change what they're doing in the present. So maybe some of the scenarios we predict don't come true, and we're glad that they don't come true. They're sort of a self-unfulfilling prophecy. Well, what do you, you think? You, it's you're, you're answering an either or, and it's both. I mean, I, I mean one of the things I have to say as a futurist, because I, I love Q&A from the audiences, and now this, is usually people pose it, is it this or this? Anytime you're setting up a duality, you're missing something, right? A duality, yin or yang, right or wrong, good or bad, uh, is nothing more than the human mind's attempt to put structure on the infinite universe. So the answer is yes and yes. It's not or, it's yes and yes. It's all of the above. Most of the stuff that's happening now is all of the above. It's going to happen. So um, I think, I think it, if, if, if I who made you know good amount of money speaking to business people? If I can't tell them, if I'm not right, they won't have me back, right? I have companies coming back and me say, "God, you were so right five years ago. We have to have you back." I mean, if you're just pontificate, if you're just a science fiction writer, that's okay. But if you're just a contemplative person about the future, you can do that. But the, the value you have with that is to then engage those that don't think about the future. Before I wrote my first book, David, in 2007, I wrote, I better do some, some, some market research. So I went out and asked people individually so they wouldn't be concerned about what they said in front of other people. I said, so let me ask you, what do you think about the future? And I thought there were two buckets and there ended up being three. The first bucket is, well, you know, I'm gonna think about it. I'm gonna call it my life. So in other words, I don't think about it. The second one said, oh, let me tell you about my plans. Right? In other words, it's all about me. It's all about what I'm going to do. And the third one said, um, what do I think about the future? I really don't. That's the biggest category. People don't think about the future. So the value for everybody here is to engage people who don't think about it to think about it. That's what the Fork in the Roads project is to, is to get people, hey, it's time now. We don't have much time left. We do have time. It, there's hope. There's hope, but we, we have to act. You can't sit back and say, well, they, or it's not, you know, the other people, the other reaction was, oh, it's horrible, right? Most people think it's horrible. So coming out of COVID, people, people seem to think that 2020 was a bad year. I mean, 
Last 10 months of 2020 was COVID. First 10 months of 2021 is COVID. Years don't change. It's dynamics. So on that point as to why people don't think seriously enough about the future, the question from Hamid Sumro, do you think society is ready for the kinds of transformations that we're talking about? Or is yes. it that people are fearful, confused, alienated and suffering from, in the words of the title of this talk, uh, cognitive dissonance? Yeah. Of course. Um, if you're waist deep in mud, are you ready to get out? Or do you want to be neck deep? Right? I mean, it, 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 what I do know from COVID is that people are unhinged. It's easier to move people who are unhinged to a new place than people who are hinged. It's easier to move people who are concerned about the future to think about the future than those that are, that are too comfortable to think about it. The good news about COVID, the good news about COVID, it's, you know, is that it's made people have to adapt. And to the degree that you didn't like COVID is it to, I mean, I'm not getting into the health things or if you lost a loved one or anything like that. But from an abstract point of view, if you don't like COVID, it's because it's made you change and you don't like to change. So futurists and people who, who, who talk and think about the future should get people open to change. That should be the responsibility of everybody in this club. Is, I mean, you can't possibly be a part of this club and not know that there's radical, huge amounts of change coming, right? You just, it, otherwise you, you're not worthy of the name futures if you, if you can't see that this is about to happen. If you can't see that there is 50 to 100 million um, climate change refugees between now and 2030, if you can't see that by 2040, there won't be beaches in Florida, if you can't see that, that uh, artificial intelligence, as people think about it, is, is going to dominate our lives unless we decide collectively how we want to integrate it. If you can't see the genetic engineering, which allows people to get rid of, of genetic diseases for all their offspring, is, is not to be kept just within the wealthy. I mean, all of these things are happening now. So you can either sit back and let it, you know, as I always say to people, let the future happen unto you, you can create it. One thing you haven't mentioned so much, although I might have missed it because there was a high bandwidth communication, is about uh, China. Uh, Dean uh, Bubbly uh, points out that the largest number of billionaires on the planet is in China. It's still they the are... United States. The fastest growing is China. Okay. So, I mean, Dean raises quite a few points in his sure. question, but I, I, I'm on, to what extent does China uh, feature in your thinking as a, a global change agent that's going to undermine legacy thinking and is going to turn the world upside down and we have to adapt to that? Yeah, so I made, I've had three speaking tours and book promotion tours in China. And my takeaway is that no doubt they are the other big player along with the United States. Uh, I mean, Russia is irrelevant except for their nukes. I mean, the Russia GDP is the size of New York State's GDP, right? So um, China, the interesting thing is, you know, when you're there, and I assume some of your members have been there, it's a completely censored con central controlled society and everybody knows that, right? So, um, the problems they're having is, is central control coming up against the market economy they've created. What I realized, two things about the Chinese is one, they are very much uh, authoritarian driven. In other words, what the, the thinking Chinese think about the Communist Party is, oh, this is the communist dynasty before the Yang dynasty and the other dynasties. So we're dynasty thought of. So we have another dynasty and they're in control and it's Chinese communists, right? The second thing is, you know, uh, my friend of mine who put me in China, he, he, who toured me in China that I referenced, he's, he's an American national now. He's got his American passport, but he's in China. And I asked him about some things came up. He says, David, never try and trust a Chinese person. So the problem that the Chinese have for global leadership is they are not trusted. They are not you know, the, America, unfortunately, airs all this dirty laundry, you know, the Donald Trump, the January 6th, all this stuff. It's open. It's shut down in China. We can't trust them. We can't trust their numbers. We can't trust. So there's no leadership to be gotten except through force for an entity that's not to be trusted. 
The third thing I'll say is that we have left, you know, the American, the Spanish empire dominated until the British defeated it. And then the British dominated it until the Americans came out and made it the American century. Now it is a, this is the century. I've been saying this since our day one of a future, 2006. The 21st century we looked back on is the century, it's the end of the nation state. The nation state can't solve climate change. The nation state can't solve immigration. The nation state can't solve energy. The nation state can't solve population. So it's global things. So, so, so the way I look back on it is that, is that um, China and the United States could be the dominant players for the next 50 years in terms of nation states, but they're gonna be subsumed by the global need for global integration. Isn't this one of the areas where there's the biggest cognitive dissonance? Because yes, although totally. people on the one hand think we need to have this kind of international cooperation, but they're resisting the idea of a global government. They hate the idea of supranational democracy. They're afraid that their own country's significance will be diminished. And I think with some justification. So no, how, no how would you? I, I mean, I, I, would, I, would, I would just say, I don't know what to call it, David. I've been mean, calling it the, the global council in the way I've been saying it is it's not going to be through governance and power. It's going to be through through issues. So for example, um, the 195 countries weighted based on their responsibility for change is, you know, the smartest chat room in the planet on energy, the smartest chat room in the planet on the, on the climate crisis. So it's not governmental. It's that it's the countries have elevated and given authority to the best and the brightest proportionately to make the decisions. So it's not going to be, it's not going to be the traditional power things is as much going to be through ideas and issues. I hope that that's the way it goes. Um, you know, it, 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 it's just like religion, you know, nationalism and religion are the two things holding back human evolution in my mind. Just time then for one final uh, question. You've yes. emphasized learning adaptability. Mm -hmm. So what have you learned and what have you adapted? And this uh, feeds into the question that Matthew Thomas raised, which is at the top of the remaining list. What is, prediction have you been wrong about in the past and what did you learn from it? Because we should so, set an example. Yeah, my example is what I said, okay. Um, my business model went away. Uh, with much negotiation with my wife, I managed to empty out a bedroom and now I have a full green screen, two computer, two screens and computers. I've completely changed my business model. In other words, I'm going to say to people, and also I'm, I'm 72, right? So I'm in good shape, but I'm 72 and I want to spend, you know, how much longer do I have? I think I'm in great shape. So I hope to have a couple of decades. But the point of the matter is I'm now saying to past clients and new potential new clients, you can pay me X the way I used to be paid and I'll get on a plane and fly to you, or you pay me one third X and I'll give you a live streaming the quality, you, 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 the best quality you've ever seen directly into your event. And by the way, using, using um, Las Vegas as a key, I've saved, if I were to fly to Las Vegas, which I do a lot, I did a lot, um, that's three tons of carbon footprint I am not placing on your conference. And believe me, that's going to be one of the metrics going forward for any large meeting is what's the carbon footprint and do we need to fly people or can we bring them in via technology? So I am setting the example with my own life. I'll make less money. I'll make a third of the money. Maybe I'll make half of the money, but that's my call to, say, to work on the planet. And by the way, it's not save the planet. It's saving ourselves from ourselves. But that's, so I've changed completely what I'm doing. As a result, I didn't know how to use a green screen. I didn't know how to use Zoom. I've learned that and now I'm learning all this other stuff because I've had to adapt. So, so the best message I can is just raise my hand and use myself as an example. So we can continue, some of us, uh, a small number can continue some of this discussion in a different format uh, afterwards. Uh, I know most people will have to leave and go back to uh, other tasks and duties, but Brian from Canada has uh, set up a Google Meet, which uh, is now in the chat. So people can click on that in a few minutes and I'll be there for 10, 15 minutes or so just to pick up any loose ends in the discussion. But I wanna to come to you, David Hull, and give you the chance uh, to make any final uh, action call. You've given us a great deal to think about. The comments in the chat are very positive. 
Uh, somebody said that every, uh, every CEO should uh, hear this presentation and there are lots of other similar comments. Uh, so thank you so much for uh, taking your on the road uh, virtual experience to us. Uh, what's your final remarks before we shut down this event? That what all of you do is really important, more important than has been now. Those of us who use futurologists or futurists or future thinkers or whatever, you have the innate sense of curiosity about the future. You need to get other people curious about it and curious about it so that they realize that, that it is them. It's not the other person. It's not waiting because it's not happening. So, you know, I always say to people, create the future you want in your life. As, as you know, the two quotes I'll leave from, from Gandhi. One is, be the change in the world you want to see, and I'm doing that. And the second thing is, um, we, humanity, and the planet can take care of everybody's needs. We can't take care of everybody's greeds. David Hull, that's a great uh, thought to end on. Let's uh, wind up here, and thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It's a thrill. As I was saying to David before, I don't get to speak to futurists. So thank you so much for your time. There isn't a speaker without an audience. So thanks for being my audience today. I really appreciate it. Thank you.